Welcome to another sermon from the Lewis Church of Christ. And now, here's Mark. But it will. Today, we will conclude our April sermon series that we have called simply Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It will always only be about Jesus. Now, I want you to know the truth. Every sermon series that we offer here at the Crossing is always going to be about Jesus. It's going to point you to Jesus. But this month, we just wanted to be extra obvious about it. And so we just called the sermon series Jesus. Well, the passage I want us to dive in today as we conclude this series, Jesus, is one of those uh, all-you-need passages. I mean, I really believe that if this, as a follower of Jesus, if this was the only Bible passage that you had, it's all you need. In fact, in someday in the future, if our Bibles are ever confiscated and, and they're taken from us and you're not allowed to have a Bible, yet you have this one memorized, it's all you need. It's that powerful. Check it out. Philippians chapter 2, I want to start with verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by became, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I really believe that's all you need. What a great text. And I want to suggest to you today from this Bible passage, from Philippians 2, like 5 through 11, that this text reveals two truths about Jesus that ought to transform the way we go about life. Two truths revealed about Jesus that ought to transform, that ought to totally change the way we go about life. The first truth that's revealed about Jesus is this. Jesus is the example we should follow. Jesus is the example we should follow. You saw verse 5, right? Verse 5 starts out, In your relationships with each other, have the same mindset of Jesus. He's the example that we should follow. Have the same mindset of Jesus. That word mindset is really interesting. The word mindset, it, it, it refers to an inner perspective that finds its way into an outward behavior. An inner perspective that finds its way to an outward behavior. And it's all about the, the, the way we go about thinking, our thought process that affects our attitude and our conduct. All right? And so our mindset, it's telling us, our mindset should be the same as, as Christ Jesus. Well... Translated, that means I, I should be thinking like Jesus. I should be demonstrating the same attitude of Jesus. And I should be just acting like Jesus. Now you get that, right? Let's specifically look at his example from this passage. Look at verse 6. Who, being very nature God, when we're talking about Jesus, you know, mindset like Jesus, who, being the very nature God, now, we're not going to be able to follow that example, but look what happens next. 
Do not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. You know what that tells me? God never once whipped out his God card to take advantage of anybody. Isn't that awesome? Jesus never once grabbed a hold of his rights to be used for self, you know, gain. That's a pretty good example. In fact, I would say that is totally selfless. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, man, if I was God, if I was part of the Godhead, I'd probably be whipping out the God card on occasion. I don't really want to wait through that line. He never whipped out the God card for his own advantage. That's totally selfless. Same mindset. Totally selfless. Look at this next verse. Look at verse 7. Look what it says about him here. Look at his example. Rather, instead of whipping out the God card, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. That word servant, I want you to know, the word servant is literally slave. Slave. And technically, it's the word bond slave, which is a reference of him having zero ownership rights at all. What? The highest God came to this earth and volunteered the lowest position of slave. That's his example. Totally selfless in the role of the lowest servant. Wow. Well, we'll look at the next verse. Look what it says about him there. Verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That word obedient, it means totally submissive. Totally submissive to the will of the Father. He was totally obedient. Even to death on the cross, he was submissive to the plan of God. So when you stand back and you look at the example of Jesus, here's what you're going to conclude. Totally selfless in the role of the lowest slave, servant, 100% submissive to the plan of the Father. A selfless, submissive servant. You wouldn't expect that, would you? I mean, we're talking about the king of the universe, and he comes in what role does he play? A selfless, submissive servant. That's incredible. And that's the example we should follow. Can I remind you the context of which these things are pointed out? The context is verse 5. Look again at verse 5. Verse 5 says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus. What if we did that? I mean, think about this. What if we really did that? What if we really followed the example of Jesus in our relationships with each other? What would our week look like if we really obeyed what's expected here. Wow, think about it. What would our marriages look like? For those of you who are married, what would what would your marriage now look like if you said, you know what? In my relationship with my spouse, I am now, I'm going to, this week, totally selfless, 100% submissive, and I'm going to be the servant. What do you think, James? That's exactly what Jesus did for us. Hey, what about in your family? What have you applied this to your family and your relationship with your children and, and children with your parents? Now, you wish all the kids were back in here at this point, don't you? But what if we, what if we did that in our families, in our relationships with each one another? And, and in our families, we decided, you know what? In my family, I'm going to serve my family. I'm going to be totally selfless. I'm going to be submissive to the will of the Father, and I'm going to take the role of servant. What do you think then? Hey, what about at work? What if you go to work tomorrow or later this afternoon or, you know, whenever you go back to work? What if you, at your workplace, you decide, you know what? I'm going to be like Jesus and I'm going to be selfless, 
I'm not going to whip out my God card. Oh, you don't have a God, God card. Let me remind you. But I'm not going to lay hold of my rights and claim and demand my rights. In fact, I'm going to be selfless. I'm going to be a servant. And I'm going to be totally submissive to the plan of God. What would work look like now? What about in our church? What if our commitment here at the crossing was always, we're going to be selfless in our relationship with each other. In fact, we're going to take the role of a submissive servant, serving one another out of love in the likeness of Jesus. Would anything change? That's what's expected of us. Because Jesus is the example we are to follow. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus. Well, that's the uh, that's the first truth revealed about Jesus. I, I want to quickly show you the second truth revealed about Jesus and ought to change how we go about life. The second truth revealed about Jesus is He is the exalted one that is to be worshipped. You saw that, right? He is the exalted one that ought to be worshipped. Look at this. Look at this next verse. Verse 9. Therefore God exalted Him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name. God exalted him to the highest place possible. It means to lift him up. It's to exalt him. It's to position him in the highest place possible. Even Jesus said in the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and earth has been now given to me. He is exalted to the highest place possible. Look at the next verse. Verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every knee should bow. Now, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. When I first read that, I'm like, no, duh. Right? No, duh. Jesus has been exalted to the highest possible position. In the whole universe, he is Lord over and above all. So every, And here's the suggestion, every knee should bow. I read that and think, no, duh, right? No, look at the next verse. And that at the name of, oh, and in every tongue, every tongue acknowledge, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And again, I read that and think, yeah, no, duh, right? He's been exalted to the highest place over all. That... The suggestion every knee should bow, huh, yeah. And every tongue confess, acknowledge he, his lordship, yeah. But I want you to know that that's really not what this text is suggesting. Uh, not at all. In fact, if you go back to the original Greek, you're going to understand that the verbs in those last two verses are, are written in the future tense. What this, this text is not suggesting that every knee should bow, although they should. And it's not suggesting that every tongue ought to acknowledge the lordship of Jesus, although they should. The verbs are written in the future tense, and so it literally should be translated, every knee will bow to the lordship of Jesus, and every tongue will confess the Lordship of Jesus. This, my friend, is not a suggestion. It's a statement. And what this text is saying is everyone, everyone will bow their knee in submission to Jesus. And everyone will confess the Lordship of Christ. Everyone will. The Buddhist will. The Muslims will. Every member of ISIS will. All the Democrats will. And all the Republicans will. And every one of us someday will. You know why? Because he is the exalted one that is to be worshipped. Amen? It's so true. So, because he is the example we ought to follow, and because he is the exalted one we ought to worship, 
Here's what that means. I want to share with you as we as I close the sermon today, four expectations that I think just flow right out of this text. I think we ought to take serious. The first expectation, because Jesus is the example to follow and because Jesus is the exalted one to worship, the first expectation is this. Keep your eyes on him. Christ follower, keep your eyes on Jesus. I want you to put all of your hope on Jesus. I want, I want you to put all of your faith and all of your trust in Jesus. I want you to focus on him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Friends, this is the key to life. And this is the key to everything else I'm going to suggest to you in these next three expectations. Keep your eyes on Jesus in your scripture reading. When you open up the Bible and you read scripture, hey, put your eyes on Jesus through the scripture. When you pray, put your eyes on Jesus. When you pray, as you go about your day, as you go about your every day, just keep your eyes Focus on Jesus. Look for him. Look for his activity. Watch for his answer to prayer. Acknowledge his presence in your life. It is the key to life. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Isn't it so easy sometimes to start putting your eyes on someone else you think looks cool and think, I want to be like them? Isn't that, so, isn't that too easy? Uh uh. Jesus. Isn't it too easy to start looking in different directions and being inspired something else? Uh uh. Keep your eyes on Jesus. It is the key to life. Number two, the, next, the second expectation I think just flows out of this passage continue to confess his placement in your life. I want you to continue to confess his position in your life. And I'd like for every one of you right now on the spot, I would like for you to evaluate his placement, his position in your life. Now, it ought to be number one. He ought to be, he, he ought to be already have been placed on the highest possible position in your life. But you know what the reality is? And the reality might be for some of you, even in the audience right now, Jesus may have fallen to maybe third or fourth place. If that's the case, can I plead with you today to lift him up, exalt him again to the highest place in your life. Turn the reins over to him. Give him control. Let him be Lord. Have him number one. And I would encourage you to continually to confess his position in your life. Keep telling him he's there. Keep telling him, you're Lord, Lord, you're Lord and God over me. Um, keep confessing his position, his rank in your life. And it ought to be number one. Now, our text kind of indicates two things, uh, two, two requirements. First of all, it mentions, you'll remember, the bending of your knees and the confession of your tongue. The bending of the knees. Now, that can be physically physical. It's just kind of an outward demonstration, but it's really spiritual. Bending of the knees is really a bending of me before his majesty. It's a bending of me to his first place in my life. It's really a bending of me where my choice is to place myself under his authority. And then the confession of my mouth the confession of my tongue, to keep reminding him over and over, your Lord here. You are Lord and God in my life. So, how often should you be confessing that? I just want to say frequent. Every morning. At the end of the day, every night, at, during the day. How about in the face of temptation? When temptation comes your way, what if that's when the confession comes out? No, Lord, you're Lord here. Think that'll change anything? Continue to confess his place in your life. Here's the third expectation I think flows right out of this text, and that is treat others the way Jesus treats you. Treat others the way Jesus treats has treated you. You remember the context, right? Verse 5 of our, of our text. It says, in your relationships with each other, have the same mindset of Jesus. Now that's verse 5. But can I remind you of verse 3 and 4? 
It's, this is, it, it says it the best. Look at this, three and four. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. Rather, in humility, I want you to value others as more important than yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? He emptied himself from heaven, he came to this earth, and he demonstrated that perfectly. Think about it. God. The highest God came to this earth with an intriguing mindset. You know what his mindset was, right? It's not about me. I'm not, I'm not going to just whip out my God card to take advantage of anybody. It's not about me. In fact, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve others. I'm here to bless others. I'm here to be submissive to the Father, Father's plan. Because Jesus knew the way up is all the way down. Treat others the way Jesus has treated you. And there's one more expectation. I think this flows naturally out of this text. And it's simply this. You may want to give your loved ones a heads up. You, you may want to give your loved ones a heads up. Because our text promises. It promises that someday everyone is going to bow their knee to the Lordship of Jesus and everyone is going to confess with their own mouth the Lordship of Jesus. Someday, everyone will do that. You might want to give your loved ones a heads up. Here's why I say that. When that day comes and we confess, or we bow our knees and confess Jesus as Lord on that day, it is going to be the most awesome of all days for those who have already been doing it. It's going to be the most awesome of all days for those who have already in the practice of confessing the Lordship of Jesus. Because on that day, He's going to usher us into eternity to be with Him forever, and it will be the most awesome of days. However, it will be the worst experience in one's existence for the one who's not prepared for that confession. It will be the worst experience of one's existence when they are broadsided by that reality. Because they will be forced to speak something they never chose. I know you want your loved ones prepared for that day. I know you want to give your loved ones a heads up about what is going to come. And here's my best advice. Do whatever you can to get them to put their eyes on Jesus. That's all they need. Do whatever you can to get them to put their eyes, to keep their eyes on Jesus. It, it may be through good questions. In your interaction, your conversation with them, just ask them good questions that just kind of tell them what they believe or, or, or maybe get to the point what they ought to believe. Or how about just tell your story? That's really what the Lord expects of us, telling our story, how we found blessings in Christ. Or maybe you living out before them such a blessed life because you have made Jesus Lord and can continue to confess Him as Lord. Or maybe maybe it's about inviting Him to the crossing. Come worship with us on Sunday. Hey, uh, you bring Him, hey, we'll tag team with you. But I know you want to give your loved ones a little heads up. Because that day come. And the truth is, Jesus is the example for us to follow, and he's the exalted one for us to worship. Amen? This has been a presentation of the Lewis Church of Christ. We are located at 15183 Coastal Highway, Milton, Delaware, three miles north of Lewis on Highway 1. Our service times are 9 a.m. and 11 a.m every Sunday morning.